done sir uh, good morning to one and all present in this uh, session uh, welcome back to the second day's uh, fdp program on iot uh, today we have four sessions uh, starting with the uh, professor rajiv ankar sir so let me introduce to you uh, professor rajiv ankar sir uh, is working as a professor of computer science in the school of computer and information sciences at the university of hyderabad he earned his phd in computer science from the school of computer science devi ahalya university indore in 1998 the german german academic exchange service awarded him sandwich model fellowship he was working in the institute for informatic free university berlin also he had a collaboration with scientists of konard juicy institute for informatic a supercomputing laboratory in berlin during his phd for two years prior to joining university of hyderabad sir has served as a lecturer in the department of computer science nmu jalgaon for 10 years from 1994 to 2004 currently he is working in the areas of parallel computing grid computing multi core computing and cloud computing he guided seven phd theses and 83 mtech dissertations he has more than 60 publications in reputed journals and conferences he served as a program committee member in many prestigious conferences such as uh, high performance computing vldb t icd cit tencon miwi etc he served as a guest editor of ijcss special issue on grid and parallel systems and was a pc program committee co chair of miwi 12 presently he is also the professor in charge of cmsd and hpc facility at the university of hyderabad thank you sir thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, 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 yes now sir please go ahead sir you can start your sessions now May thank I you proceed? very much uh, uh, dr nagender for the generous introduction uh, good morning to all the participants uh, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, faculty development program uh, has been organized by school of computer information sciences uh, at university of hyderabad and uh, fortunately we have a very strong team now uh, who can actually take you to a correct path there are several other speakers who are coming in the line uh, who, who are very uh, they are eminent in their own uh, uh, research areas uh, very well known and probably uh, when you go from here probably you will get a lot of uh, lot of things from uh, this point um before i start my uh, lecture i would like to first uh, share the screen and then uh, i would like to uh, talk to you also about uh, okay the first question is that uh, uh, is it uh, is it uh, visible to you all of you yes sir okay good now uh, before i go to the presentation uh, i would just uh, like to ask you um all the participants uh, uh, that uh, how many of you have an exposure to cloud computing exposure in a sense that uh, uh, you have worked on it or you have uh, taught it or uh, in a sense somewhere rather some uh, guided some research project or something uh anyone any participant who can speak okay uh, am i audible to you all the participants yes sir yes okay. sir sir one okay. minute sir yes okay you basically you sir, have uh, uh, unmuted the mics uh, no issues no issues uh, i would just uh, uh, like uh, if you can uh, 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 unmute their mics basically you must have unmuted. yes sir okay yes sir i unmuted them sir yes yes, yes. so uh, uh, anyone who would like to tell uh, you are teaching cloud computing or you have an exposure to cloud computing participants could respond i unmuted all of you okay fine so uh, with the assumption that uh, like a few of you are uh, having a good exposure a working exposure in cloud computing that means you have been using it in to day to day life few of them uh, would be teaching also cloud computing few of them want to start their career into a cloud computing or into
ஜமிஷன் <laughs> and probably you know that uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, very well known uh, people in the area of high performance computing or cloud computing uh, which are basically indians one of them would be talking to you today as well in the afternoon after my session professor buya is one among them uh, cloud services are everywhere we know that whether we are talking about salesforce to twitter to a skype or linkedin amazon web services youtube adobe where whatever you talk now everything is on cloud so whether we uh, know or do not know but somewhere or other we are actually touching cloud computing and that's the reason why it is very important for us to really know about what again how exactly uh, it is happening if i uh, like to tell what cloud cloud computing is so it is basically a, a utility oriented uh, internet centric uh, way of delivering it services and on demand and uh, this service these services actually covers the entire um, computing stack hardware infrastructure that you can actually hire which is packaged in the set of uh, virtual machines or you can have a development or deployment platform or you can uh, you can access uh, distributed application so this is a, uh, a broader level that uh, probably we would like to talk about uh somebody has raised the hand uh, uh can you just yeah sir, can you just go to the presentation mode sir slide is not visible sir oh, your yes. screen is visible. Yes, actually your screen is pin inwa sir i sir, i could see this uh, presentation sir i could see uh, uh, okay sir sir so please go ahead sir please continue sir so somebody has raised the hand sir uh, just i uh i uh, i send an unmute re uh, request please accept and if yes, there is anything like uh, you would like to ask the speaker you could ask yes if you have any question please ask the slides are visible yes sir okay fast so uh, cloud computing actually allow um, the entire stack to be made available in the form of hardware infrastructure development and deployment platform or a distributed applications here now this this particular computing paradigm is not uh, new in a sense that there are a couple of early remarks uh, on internet and cloud computing uh, this gentleman who is a father of internet and who has developed the mathematical theory of uh, packet uh, networks uh, named as uh, leonard klein rock is first suggested uh, i uh, a quote as of now the computer networks are still in their infancy but as they grow up and become more sophisticated we will probably see the spread of computer utilities which like present electric and telephone utility will service individual homes and offices across the country unquote uh, this is one of the first remarks which was made uh, maybe around 51 years back or 52 years back uh, where there was no internet there was no nobody actually thought of but that is a visionary statement that uh, actually this gentleman has made there are other remarks uh, some of the experts attribute the cloud computing to uh, john mccarthy who is more known for uh, one of the founders for artificial intelligence and uh, he actually posted the idea of computers being delivered as a public utility which is very similar to the service bureaus uh, which were there at that time or in the, they were in the 60s uh, if we generally want to see we would always go to uh, uh nist definition uh, which actually defines cloud computing is a model for enabling convenient on demand nectar network access to a shared pool of configurable resources which includes everything network server storage application and services and these uh, things can be provisioned and released with a minimal management efforts or service providers interaction this is one of the uh, standard definitions that you would see of cloud there is another definition which was proposed in 2009 which says that a cloud is a type of a parallel and distributed systems now here 
it includes both aspects sterilization also and distributed system also consisting of interconnected and virtualized computers which are dynamically provisioned and presented as a one or more unified computing resources based upon the sla established through the negotiation between the service providers and consumer but this particular definition actually includes uh, several other things also um, you have important concept something like it is a interconnected and virtualized computers uh, programming is supposed to be done uh, both in a parallel and distributed way there should be some way in which the negotiation between the service provider and service consumer can be done with the use of a service level agreement and so on so it uh, it includes several parts of that which are required to be done in cloud computing so basically when we are working on a cloud computing it is not only just talking about the uh, provisioning of the services but there are several other essential portion if somebody is working on a designing what is a service level agreement that are there between the service provider and service consumer that is also a part of development in cloud computing important characteristics we all know very quickly i'll go through which talks about uh, it is a virtual in nature so the physical location of underlying infrastructure details are transparent to the user they are not known where exactly those physical resources are scalable that means it should be able to break the complex workload into small pieces to be solved across incrementally expandable infrastructure efficient because it uses a service oriented architecture for dynamic provisioning of the resources it is flexible in nature because it can have a variety of workload both of type uh, something like a consumer kind of thing or it is a commercial kind of a thing and elastic in nature the elasticity is one of the uh, very important aspect of cloud computing which actually shrinks and grow based upon the requirement which will follow the principle of create use and destroy principle and elasticity is one of the uh, one of the toughest challenges actually because there is a lot of uh, ai based work which is going on in this particular area something like is it possible for you to identify that how many number of virtual machines are needed at a given point of time or if there are several um, uh, servers on which these virtual machines are scattered together uh, scattered then how do i consolidate them and bring them onto one place so that i can bring down the other resources which are not related and so on so uh, based upon those there are several uh, research areas which are open so this particular slide actually talks you or give you several several areas where even the uh, participants can actually think about working into the research different research area now these uh, essential characteristics as defined in the nist definition of cloud computing would actually uh, boils down to something like on demand uh, self services ubiquitous internet accesses uh, network accesses location transparency elasticity and measurement of the services as per the use so any such uh, delivery that can be done or any such service delivery which can be done would require to have these kind of characteristics in order to to be called as a a cloud computing uh, uh, when we are doing it now so one of some of the benefits of usage of cloud is there is no infrastructure investment is required suppose that i i want to make use of a dgx box dgx2 box which is not available at university of hyderabad then uh, i can hire it like i do not want to really buy that but i i can go and hire that services from nvidia i say that okay i want my computing to be executed for this much amount of time i need it so there is no infrastructure investment required by everything the hardware need not be replicated at every place this is on on demand services you get it when you need it well you can always work on proper pricing you only pay what you and how much you want to pay there are several researches uh, going on in the area of how do i come up with a proper pricing thing in one of the research uh, that we have contributed is to came up with a brokerage strategy to find it out that at a given point of time and given the quality of service requirement that the user poses what is the best resource which is available in terms of prices in terms of services in terms of security and so on so you can you can fine tune your uh, your attributes to find it out that which are the resources available at a given point of time based upon your pricing efficient resource allocation because since uh, different people live in different zones 
some of them when they are using it the another uh, uh, people in the another zone may not be using it and so on so the efficient resource allocation is possible and high availability one can always be uh, thinking that okay if if uh, for the users it is always like a case that uh, the machines are available so on the back uh, on the background probably one need to find it out the ways in which this high availability is to be maintained so the cloud providers actually working on that particular aspect they are we're trying to see that how high availability can be done. Now, if I try to see the differences between the traditional and the virtual machines, so the left side figure actually talks about what the traditional computer uh, do. So if I have a machine on my desktop. I have all the hardware which is available to me. I have an operating system and I have a set of applications which are running on this operating system. So this is a standalone computing system. After virtualization, uh, of course, we have some kind of a layer which would be sitting somewhere. Either it would be on top of hardware or it would be sitting on top of operating system or it would be sitting on somewhere else. But there is some kind of a virtual, uh, virtualization layer. We sometimes also uh, call it as a hypervisor or virtual machine monitor. And now it is capable of providing machines to us. And it would be the uh, the user may not be directly talking to the hardware, but they are going through this virtualization layer in order to see it. So whatever the machine that I actually work on, you can create several virtual machines, and uh, uh, and uh, and the user should be able to access those virtual machines. Now, uh, virtualization itself is a huge area. What uh, what what happens when I put it uh, on top of hardware? What happens? I put it on the top of operating system. What happens when the virtualization layer works along with the operating system in order to uh, create the virtual machine and so on? At this point of time, for the cloud users, I assume that there is a certain way of providing the virtual machine to the user with the use of some kind of a virtualization technique. Probably you can uh, immediately also see that. Uh, in case if you go, probably this is one of the uh, very um, uh, popular uh, choices. We have a virtu uh, Oracle virtual uh, virtual box. What you can do is that you can download that virtual box, and then you can have different flavors. So what generally what will happen if you have a hardware which is available with you, then you can have a, any host platform. Then if you put a virtualization layer in the, in the form of a Oracle virtual box. Then you can you can bring different kind of images onto it, and then in that virtual box you would be basically getting different kind of virtual machines. Now this is a classical thing that you can immediately do it with your own. Now one of the ways in which you can uh, demonstrate to the users or to the students is to work on that. You can you can find it out one server which is available on your uh, your premises. Then you can put a uh, operating system on top of that, you put a virtual box, and then you can create a server where the students can actually access it on. You can account. so this is these are the small demonstration that you can show the usage of uh, hiring something on top of the hardware which is available to you. So virtualization is a large umbrella of technologies and concepts. These are mean to be providing the abstract environment whether this is a virtual hardware or an operating system to run some kind of an applications. And this term often uh, be, seen, uh, uh, be spoken along with, mostly it would be a hardware virtualization because it plays an important role with an efficient delivery of infrastructure as a service solution to the cloud computing. So something like I'm hiring uh, the hardware that I need, uh, which is, uh, I may not have that powerful machine, but I really want to make use of that. Something like a service delivery model, which is called as an infrastructure as a service on cloud computing. And that's why it is with. And what is this layer? This is responsible for hosting and managing all the virtual machines on a virtual machine monitor, VMN. In certain cases, it would be hyper hypervisor, which would be directly running on the hardware. So whenever this VMM, which is running on the hypervisor, it implements the virtual machine hardware abstraction and is also responsible for running the operating systems here. Oh, one of the most important aspects that everybody has to understand is that VMM has to partition and share the resources which are available on the hardware. 
So suppose that if I have some kind of a hardware which is very powerful in nature, something like an IBM Power Series machine, and uh, I know that it is a 64 node power machine, IBM Power Machine, but it is underutilized. So what I can do is, is that I can create several virtual machines on top of that, and then I can allocate those machines to different students to work on. So this is a classical example where the resource utilization can be done in a proper way. So instead of only one user is working or only one application working in simultaneously, I want to scale it. This is way one can think about. If I look into the evolution of uh, computing in terms of the virtual machine, then uh, earlier it was no sharing, something like I have an application, runtime, operating system, and hardware. Everything was on, on the same uh, premise. Then I actually think about a virtual machine where you have a hardware which is with me, but then with the use of um, a virtual machine, I create with the use of hypervisor, I create the virtual machine and uh, we go on. So I would actually begin with this. Then I will say that what is the next thing and next thing as, as, an, uh, as a, my lecture progresses. Now, first, let me first see that how exactly the cloud computing architecture looks like. So uh, uh, you are aware of that. Uh, there are several uh, as a service nowadays, we can see it. Infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service, everything is a service. Then you have a container as a service and function as a service. And so there are so many. From the architectural perspective, uh, let me just confine myself into first begin with the infrastructure, platform as a software for cloud computing. And then we'll talk about the recent developments that are taking place in terms of as a service and what is the consequence, whether we can compare these two things in some way or not, we would actually look into that. Now here is, we, we see it here, we have a cloud resources on the bottom, then we have a, a VMM, virtual machine monitor, then you have a hosting platform. On top of that, you have a cloud programming environment and tools, and then we have top of that, you have application. Now what constitute what? So there are, even if we talk about the infrastructure as a service, and infrastructure as a service management, what actually makes only the infrastructure of service, uh, there is a slight uh, difference here. So if I talk about a pure infrastructure as a service, then it has something to do with the core middleware, which is required in order to create virtualization kind of environment. Something like, and top of that, some of the services, something like a QS negotiation or administration control or pricing, SLA management or monitoring, execution management, metering and accounting and everything. So this is a this is a core core thing that somebody has to do it. And together with the underlying hardware, it, it is called as a infrastructure as a service complete. So it has two parts. One is a hardware part, which would be made, which would be virtualized. And then on top of that, what is a software component that is required in order to um, uh, in order to provision it to the user. So this is we call as a infrastructure service. If I talk about a pure platform as a service, then there are two aspects. One is a deployment and another one is a development and deployment. So anything which is required in order for, for the service provider to provide that thing to the user actually comes into this part. So we have a web 2.0 or 3.0, then you have mashups, then you have workflows. You, have, you require to have some kind of a runtime environment where the user can write the concurrent or distributed jobs and so on. So that comes into a pure platform as a service. But if you if, if you want to provide that thing to the third party or to the somebody, then you require the below stack also. You require to have a complete. So you require to have a hosting environment. You require to have a, a cloud resources, which actually makes a complete platform as a service. And then on top of that, you have a software as a service, which you have been using it in the form of a Google Doc or so many other software services. But in order to realize it, you require the underlying all the state. So this is how actually we can think about pure and then in order to provide it to the user, what additionally you require it. So this is how you can look into it. Well, uh, uh, if you do a major classification of a uh, this form of a internet-based computing, 
then you call them in the three form is infrastructure as a service where sometimes people call is a hardware as a service also where the cpu cycle uh, storages are actually been provisioned apart from that you have a platform as a service uh, where you have a, a couple of uh, services service providers something like google app engine uh, uh, azure uh, of from microsoft or aneka from manjra soft and there are several others also so you call this a platform as a service where they provide you the development kind of environment and then you finally you have a, a software as a service here we'll go one by one and try to understand very quickly so here the capabilities which are provided in infrastructure services to the consumer is to uh, rent the things processing storage disk network and so on and uh, we uh, actually um, uh, there will not be any uh, management and control of the underlying hardware resources and uh, but it has a control over the operating system storage deployed our uh, application possibility of uh, networking component firewall load balancer all those things that would come into this infrastructure services if i talk about platform it enables user to deploy user build application into a virtualized um, uh, platform here so it includes everything something like a middleware uh, databases development tools deployment tools runtime support and so on so that would actually constitute um, developing into platform so platform includes both as i told you in the earlier figure both hardware as well as in the software and it is integrated with a specific programming interfaces so you require to have uh, the uh, the providers actually supply you with a set of apis and software tool in order to develop your applications here so the user is freed from uh, managing the cloud infrastructure the automatic scaling shrinking everything would be taken care by the service provider here on top of that sort of software as a service which is based upon a simple model you have to subscribe to a service over the period of time on internet and once the subscription is over you have to again actually subscribe to it and so on so in case of a software as a service model the customer does not take the ownership of the software but it will subscribe to it and majority of our uh, um, software packages that are nowadays which are coming if you talk about matlab or uh, if you talk about google docs or any other things or even for uh, a whole windows stack microsoft stack which you use they are all available as in the form of a subscription so that provides a comprehensive solution and that is delivered to you remotely over the internet here and then you have everything as a service also it is one of the most important uh, element of the computing it provides you anything whatever you look look, look into everything is a service here now uh, as a computer scientist i should be aware of that what is the role of and how exactly i design it suppose that i want to uh, i want to design is infrastructure as a service solution for the customer then what should i have actually what is where exactly i need to contribute so one of the most important layer of infrastructure as a service implementation is the infrastructure management software layer this one and the job of this infrastructure management software layer is to manage the virtual machines and this this is done with the use of scheduling so the scheduler would be responsible for for the management of all the virtual machines which are available here so suppose that i am i am a service provider cloud service provider where i Uh, on my hardware i create the virtual virtual machines several machines are there and i want to sell it to the user now what is required i require to have some kind of a scheduler which does a management of the virtual machine and it has several other components something like a pricing and billing i should be able to know that how much i should ask the user to pay for how do i meet the qas requirement of the user when the services are going on how do i monitor those services whether there is the services are going on properly as per the qas parameter whether it is possible for anybody to reserve those uh, virtual machines if i say that i need a virtual machines from 7 to 9 whether it is possible for me to get it or else how do i put those virtual machine images into the repository do i have a, a pool from where i do management of that so everything would be taken care a uh, bit the infrastructure management software layer and its job is to manage all virtual machines and often in case if uh, uh, 
if I am unable to scale beyond my hardware limit, provisioning is to be done. So this is the last uh, which I was talking about provisioning. It's something like if I do not have those virtual machines, with the um, without the knowledge of the user, is it possible for me to get some kind of a third party uh, virtual machines and I, I can provide it to the user? Now, this is, that is also a part of this thing. Well, when I see several solutions which exist um, in commercially, then more or less they would have these kind of components. But it all depends upon that how do they actually uh, implement those. Well, the components might be different, but mostly it would require minimum these components in order to manage infrastructure as a service to the end user here. I was talking about something about uh, images. So image is basically a static data. It is containing the operating system and application together with their configuration and data files, everything. And uh, that is a virtual machine which runs uh, once this is started. So it is like packet, packaged unit that would be available in repository. So it is generally stored onto a disk and uh, uh, you can store it anywhere, but you can generally it would be stored into a specific uh, area. Um, based upon the service providers, they call it with the different names, but there would be some location where those static images are available here. Whereas instance is basically running a virtual machine. So that means it has been started from the image and it is capable of running the operating system and processes, performing different kind of computation, IO or everything. So it has to perform certain operation. Uh, to which you are actually interacting to or you are talking to. Now, if I look into the architecture from uh, of a platform as a service solution, so it provides the deployment as well as development platform for running the applications. So they constitute the middle where on top of which the application can be built. And if you look into the reference model of platform as a service, then this the platform as a service core middleware which is seen here in the middle is the important part and there are several components into it you have the uh, uh, you have the you should have the runtime uh, framework which can allow user to develop and deploy the applications management of the resources uh, elasticity and scaling so this is one of the component that we have discussed about cloud that should have required to have an application management. Um, it should have some units, something like a QS or SLA management and billing and the user management. So in each, essentially, these are the important parts that uh, we do it and out of which a runtime framework is one of the most important component, uh, which actually makes a platform as a service solution. This particular uh, component represents the software stake for pass model. This framework executes the user code according to the policies which are set by the user and the provider. So whatever the SLA that has been signed between, so runtime framework is responsible to adhere to that and then perform the operation. Another important component is an abstraction because platform as a service solutions actually uh, distinguishes by the level of abstraction that they provide. And mostly it provides a higher level of abstraction to the user here. In case of a pass, the major focus is on running of an application that cloud should always do it. So abstraction of the resources, but at the same time providing the solution to it. The third important component of PaaS is automation of several things, something like deployment. So it has to provide the uh, facility to deploy the application to an infrastructure and should be able to provision the resources both ways, scaling up and scaling down. Suppose that if the user is, uh, user is asking for several resources, but those resources are unutilized. So it should have the capability of scaling it down. Or else if the user is thinking about scaling it up, something like when I was talking about uh, when uh, uh, we, are, we are organizing this kind of a conferences, uh, faculty development programs, 
we need more more licenses for 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 the zoom meeting this thing so basically you have scaled this thing now in the same way in case if i need more resources to be scaled so there should be a provision of scaling it so this pro, pro, uh, this process is performed automatically and according to the sla which is made between the customer and the provider here and the last one among these is services so all the platform as a service offering provides the set of apis which actually help you to simplify the creation of the application which would be elastic in nature and highly available in the cloud environment so uh, the service provider should be able to provide those apis also to the user that would help him to achieve those important aspects which are required in case of a cloud offerings and that's the reason why there is a several category of platform as a services uh, you you can see it here but i'd like to tell you that platform as a service is one of the most uh, uh, used thing in in case of a cloud because uh, there is a huge uh, like uh, uh, possibilities for the user to come up with their offerings any such services which actually user wish to offer based upon the qs parameter and sla that can be a thing and that's the reason why many uh, uh, developers actually work in this area of, of uh, defining those set of apis which actually provides the uh, consumer with the uh, platform as a service offering you have variety of uh, categories of platform as a service you have a runtime environment with web hosted application de uh, development platform and then you have a vendors specific to that you have another set category of pass where the runtime environment would require to scale in order to uh, web application to execute here so this is another uh, platform as service something like a complete uh, scaling which should be done and uh, if you see into the product type something like a google app engine is uh, providing you with uh, middleware and infrastructure you have a Heroku is one of the um, another uh, platform as a service provider, which also provides you the middleware and then uh, and the infrastructure. There are a couple of them which actually provide only the middleware, uh, something like and so on. So even if we talk about my, Microsoft Azure, which is a platform as a service kind of free, uh, which has uh, further capability. So if you look into the platform as a service, it's a normal runtime environment. With with web hosting or email hosting or rapid application prototyping or those things that will fall into a platform as a service category number one. In the second one, it should have a capability of scaling up and scaling down. So we call it a pass of type two. And then you have a Google App Engine, then Heroku, and so on. There is a third category where you have the um, middleware and programming model which is not only providing the first two scaling and this thing but also it uh, allows you to create a distributed applications or parallel applications on the cloud so uh, there are several uh, players in this and uh, they provide you something like microsoft azure is one of them which provides you middleware and infrastructure and there are a couple of other players here or other vendors uh, they provide you only the middleware you require to come up with your own infrastructure so the major cloud providers will provide you the infrastructure also but there would be some uh, vendors who would only provide the solution they would provide you the set of apis which can be used and then uh, you can hire your resources from somewhere else i can hire the resources from amazon and then i use the platform as a service from somebody else and we'll do it so that's how this let this category platform as a service which has been used and often this is the area where a majority of the uh, like uh, researchers actually focus on now uh, i'll give a couple of examples of cloud platforms uh, one of the uh, one of the most uh, uh, like um, uh, important and uh, famous uh, offering cloud offering we call is amazon elastic compute cloud ec2 it has several offering but in the form of a elastic compute cloud it provides the virtual computing environment which will allow the user's job to run on a Linux and Windows environment. So uh, generally what happens, the user can either create 
uh, machine, uh, some uh, machine images, we call it AMI, Amazon Machine Image. Image. It should be containing the applications, libraries, data, and associated configuration settings. Or you can select it from the globally available Amazon machine images. So both these facilities have been provided here. Now, in order to use it, the user has to uh, upload this created uh, image to Amazon simple storage service, we call it a S3 service, before they can be started, stopped, monitored. So uploaded EMI can be actually be seen there. Now, if it is only infrastructure as a service offering, this is a way that Amazon actually provides you. So it is almost like it is almost like when I'm when I'm connecting to machine, and suppose that I want a complete uh, cluster available on which I can uh, I can write my program and I can do certain things. So I need some higher end machine with eight GB of RAM and certain uh, parameters that I specify. So you can select those images and then you can actually run those images. Uh, actually, you have to put it into Amazon Simple Storage Service and then you can stop it. So st start and then stop it here. In terms of a platform as a service, Google App Engine allows users to run web applications which are written in Python, Java, PHP, Go, Node.js, or .NET, or Ruby programming languages. And as it suggests, platform as a service supports a set of APIs for the data stores. So you may have uh, several uh, things that probably the user may be uh, willing to do. It may be trying to access the storage. It may be trying to um, write the SQLs which can access the information and so on. So you, you can actually do it. And there are several components. Uh, they have different names. They have been given into uh, by the Google App Engine, uh, the Google. And then you can <laughs> fetch those, uh, perform the manipulation, uh, perform and then manipulate those things and you can do it. So services are also been provided with the security, which we call as a sandbox in case of a Google App Engine. So this is a primary uh, like thing which I thought I will actually talk about. So here, in all those cases, whatever we have discussed, different form of the offerings, whether it is infrastructure or it is a platform, and you know that software as a service is basically a subscription model. You have the hardware. On top of that, there is an operating system. Then you have virtual machines, and then you you have several virtual machines. So this is this is a figure which actually talks several things. Probably you are aware of that when I talk about the hardware. Then uh, anything which has to talk to the hardware, they have to use ISA. In case if the upper layer wants to talk to the operating system, you have a application binary in, in, uh, interface. Or on top of that, you have several other things. So when, uh, when I'm talking about uh, virtualization, there are two different form of virtualization that we spoke about is like uh, you have a virtual machine, which is running on top of an operating system and provide the, uh, provide the virtual machines, or else you would have the, uh, you have a hardware on top of which you have a virtual machine monitor and then you provide the services. So first is known as a hosted kind of virtualization and second one is known as a native kind of virtualization. But as a, as a user of a cloud, we may not be really bothering for really how exactly the virtual machines which have been provided to, to us. But as a computer scientist or as a researcher, I should be aware of that. Now I'll take you to another level, which we call as a uh, containers, which are actually becoming uh, really uh, very popular in uh, recent times. So uh, in, we started with uh, no sharing, where hardware, operating system, runtime, and uh, applications, they all would be in a no sharing uh, listing mode. Then we have a virtual machines where either it is a hosted or native. You have a hardware on top of that. You create a different virtual machine. You have an operating system. Then you have a runtime and the application that runs. Then you have a container. Now this is something that is becoming recently very popular in the industry for several reasons. And then in the coming uh, slides, we will be discussing about why this is becoming important and how do I connect this thing 
to the next level that uh, this whole workshop is all about. So container are basically uh, some kind of a software running units, which are created from some kind of images. And it allows multiple such execution unit to work on top of operating system. So basically it is an operating system level virtualization where you have packaged several things and then you provide the user with a isolated unit or isolated execution unit. <clears throat> so, so let us talk something about container and Docker containers. Uh, so far, whatever we have seen, we have seen that hardware virtualization is one way of providing the resources to the user and they can offer several uh, services to the um, consumer. But you require to have a hypervisor here, which will create the image of the hardware and then you require to share those actual physical hardware resources by multiple virtual machines on top of that. So what has been seen here is that there is a significant overhead of doing all those things. We require to uh, put several things. A hard uh, virtualization layer has to be put and then you have to think about that what kind of virtual machine the user is required for what kind of operation and so on. There is a significant repetitive work and uh, every operating system require an individual configuration. And the success depends upon uh, how well or how exactly you have done the things. So there is a lot of uh, overhead in terms of repetition of several things. And that's the reason why the industry actually came up with another form we call it the container. It is a standard unit of the software that uh, packages up code and all its dependencies so that application can run quickly and reliably from one computing environment to the other. Now, uh, what does it say? One of the first thing is that whatever is required for a for an application to run, whatever the software stake is required, that should be there. It should be packaged together. I can put it in somewhere. I can put it either on my machine or it's somewhere else on some, some other place in the form of an image. And I bring run that thing and actually uh, work on. Probably the question that comes to my mind is that why this is then different from my platform as a service? There also I'm doing the same thing, isn't it? I'm, I'm packaging the several thing, I'm providing the set of APIs, I'm providing the development and deployment environment and so on. So how it is different than in that case? We will talk about that in after a couple of slides. But what I say is that, this is an operating system level virtualization in a sense that containers run on top of operating system, bring their own runtime and perform the operation. All runtime dependencies, libraries, whatever is required, they bring them together, perform the operation and they go move on. And all of them, containers, enable the abstraction of resources at the operating system level. And that's the reason why it is enabling multiple applications to share the binaries where the remaining isolation from one another. So they isolate from one another and then share certain things. So the certain things which are shared are basically the kernel of an operating system, some of the routines of the kernel of operating system. But other things are, they are taking, uh, they are bringing their own, performing the operation and going back. Let us try to understand that how exactly they do it and what are the important benefits if I, if I work on a container kind of an environment. One of the first thing that you look into is that you have, you may have an operating system here. And top of that, you can run the container. So eliminate the, the requirement of a heavy uh, hypervisor. I will not say that there is no hypervisor or there is no other software stake required. Yes, you do require on a top of an operating system, you do require some kind of an engine, which would be helping for the execution of containers. But each such execution unit is not that heavy. So you have a far less resource overhead compared to if I'm working on an actual virtual machine kind of environment. You require fewer operating system to support. You have a similar application deployment 
and provisioning of resources has improved a lot because your your images are not that heavy compared to the virtual machine because if you if you want to put a virtual machine because you have to put in case if it is an operating system if it has a complete stack which is almost like putting everything on top of that if you if you get a virtual machine here so you have far less resources overhead is one of the important now what is docker now i i was talking about container so container are basically something like a running entity similar to a process finally it is basically a process which is running and taking uh, working uh, with whatever required in order to execute here now what is a docker docker is basically a platform for developing and shipping as well as running the distributed application using container based virtualization techniques so it is a platform which actually allows you and this is an open source it started with uh, uh, with uh, with google and but it became later on the open source here. there is another thing which we talk about a docker containers image so this is a lightweight stand alone executable package of software that includes everything needed in order to run an application that means code runtime system tools libraries and setting everything is packaged into single form and then they are kept as an image somewhere some some hub where it can be kept here something called a docker hub or it can be available on your own machine also and so on now uh, if i see a pictorially then you have this kind of a container based virtualization where infrastructure is same you have an operating system majority of the time so far if i look into the research more than 90% of the time people are using linux as an operating system uh, on which this docker engine sits so you can download the docker engine put it onto your own machine if you have a, something like a linux kind of an operating system which i don't say that it is not available for others it is available for other operating system also but i'm talking in terms of the usage uh, majority of time there are more linux users so i can put a docker engine and then i can i can create those images and then somebody wants to run it then they become container so it is a running entity container is a running entity which will be running on top of that so suppose that if i want to do it i have a microsoft uh, windows operating system on my machine so one of the things which i do is that i'll i'll take a docker engine which supports the creation of uh, such images which run it if i want a linux kind of an environment uh, where the container pertaining to linux wants to be executed one of the solution could be i have an operating system available is a window then what i do is that i actually i put a, a virtual box on top of that with some kind of a linux flavor or there are several ways in which people do it then i put a docker engine on top of that and i create containers which can be provisioned to the users so container based virtualization requires some kind of a engine on top of which the containers can execute here so how it does it it does it by virtualizing the operating system of the computer on which it is installed and then running on one of the first versions if you look into the history it was released some 8 years back 2013 and then it was evolved over the period of time so docker is developed using go programming language by google and now it is an open source so one of the first thing probably once you go from here those who have not actually having an account on docker you have to create an account on docker and start working on that why the containers or if i look into if i try to see that containers versus virtual machine then containers are more lightweight by lightweight i mean that in terms of the sizes uh, they are lightweight and uh, whatever is required i can put it into that container and probably uh, you would you would appreciate that when you if you want to perform certain operation on some of the iot devices if you want to put it something while you you may not you these are the resource constraint devices and on all, all those resource constraint devices you require to have some kind of a virtual environment in order to perform certain operation suppose that if i want to perform some kind of a uh, analytics on top of that like uh, analytics software should be required to be there here 
for all the requests which are coming to coming there if you want some whether a request go to this place or that place something like small application now I, I require some kind of a lightweight environment which would be executing here and you require several of them several application would be running suppose that on on raspberry pi or something so containers are more lightweight more amenable for for deploying it on top of resource constraints constraint devices no need to install the guest operating system only with the linux key because what you say i will not say that there is no operating system but operating system has several portion actually you do not require a kernel to be made available on the on the containers so kernel that was designed by linux on top of uh, which we call now is a linux operating system so kernel of that because for linux operating system it has several parts okay so one of the important part is a kernel so kernel need not be there you may have several other component and it varies actually what exactly how much operating system portion that you want to put it on to that and otherwise it would be a very light operating system with small functionality a few choices are something like alpine linux which would be around 5 mb or it would be a busy box which is even smaller than that 2.1 or 2.3 mb you can see different versions of busy box and try to suit so what we do we what we achieve is that you have a less cpu ram storage needed so more containers per machine than a virtual machine is one of the best we think because i i may not really require all that thing. i may not require it and that's the reason why you can you can do a finer grain level virtualization in a better way the most more efficient virtualization and that's how you can see it on side you have a containers where you have an operating system docker and then you have several such uh, uh, containers which are running on other side you have a hypervisor which is very heavy you have a host operating system then you have a hypervisor and then you are mimicking the whole infrastructure by dividing the resources in terms of a main memory secondary storage and then even the hardware and so on so this is how you can actually so when uh, when we are using docker we start with a base image we boot it up okay we create the uh, all the changes whatever i want to put it something like a program executable unit if you want to put it and those are those changes are saved in a layered way forming another image so you have a base image and then you create the another image probably one question that comes to my but is it that everything is a base image so no you can create your own image also from the scratch where you may not have anyone in the operating system you can create your own image which is there is a, just an executable so all the choices are there but often you would find out that majority of those images would have some flavor of an operating system available that would be very small flavor but it is granularity would vary actually you can have a very small uh, image base or you can have a very large image base both are possible here so an instance of an image is called a container that means when it is running here so if we have an image which is set a set of layers which we defined it and if you want to start this particular image we call them is a running this particular image and we can have many such running containers of the same image and pictorially that has been specified like this um you have here you have a, a docker file you can build this docker file taking those images so you require to write a docker file what you want there you take a image you write it everything here so uh, when you take it then those taking those images you can run them in the form of a container container may be stop pause or restart kind of a thing that is can be done here so whatever you can do with the process then you can do it and once you finish this thing you can commit it back to the in the form of image either you can save it okay or you can lo uh, load it from the back file or you can push it to the docker registry and pull it from the docker registry so now this is away from uh, from uh, your your environment it is somewhere else so you have a docker registry there what constitute this thing and what is so important about docker containers so docker engine is basically responsible for managing all those containers and uh, there are certain aspect the docker containers which run on docker engine are standard in nature so it defines the standard for container so when i when i select a docker engine so it defines some kind of a standard for container so that 
they should be portable anywhere so when i create some kind of a image here it should be able to be executed on other place that's the reason why you have standardization process required it is lightweight because it shares a machines operating system kernel and other things it would be carrying so therefore it do not require operating system per application which is driving a higher level of efficiencies and reducing the server licensing cost so if you if you are not using the complete operating system then you you actually reduces the cost of licensing here secure in nature because it isolates itself from other application even if it is running on the same machine the applications are safer in container and docker provides the very strong isolation capabilities in the industry which is available at this point of time what are the advantages if i look into this so multiple applications with a different application requirement and dependencies as long as they have the same operating system requirements they can go here so you can have multiple such applications with different requirements they can go here okay as long as if i have base images which i take it they would be of same operating system on which this is actually working on but it doesn't stop you you can always create a virtual machine where on which on on top of which you can create several uh, several containers so there is no replacement as such i'm not saying that you replace it with with uh, virtual machines is replaced with docker but you can make use of this complement to each other you can create a virtual machine on top of which you can allow several such containers to be running if i require a different kind of a container to be executing you have a virtual machine with that kind of environment and so on so you you optimize several thing including the storage apart from that it is a robustness container does not have an operating system installed it consume a very little memory in consumption of a virtual machine compared to whatever you and also reduces the boot up time it it really works very fast if i if i just uh, if i start running the container it boots up very fast even if even if it in operating system and of course this is a cost which we already seen um, depending upon uh, uh, what you uh, what you execute it depending upon that hardware requirement will be reduced which is reducing the cost of this thing so the applications with different operating system requirement cannot be hosted together on the same docker host because i told you that it has a dependency on operating system but that does not limit actually you can always have another virtual machine on which another operating system is installed here how how do you achieve it so it is a client server based application with uh, uh, major components the server uh, component is there which should be continuously running we call it a daemon process and then you have a set of rest apis representational state transport is architectural state and then based upon this architectural states you have set of apis which actually specifies the interface that program can use to talk to the daemon and instruct it that what is to be done and also has a command line interface so that constitute a this thing docker engine will not go into the detail of how exactly it would work here but you require to have a docker engine where you have all the three components the server component which would be continuously running your set of apis which can talk to this then you have a client docker a command line interface using which you can manipulate those images talk to you can bring it you can execute you can you can put it into the stop state pause state halt state all that thing that you can do it with that kind of a cli containers may be in the live pause or deleted states so they are created from the images at docker hub or at a local storage so that's how it now we have reached to a stage where we started with a virtual machine if i give a normal virtual machine with a normal operating system nothing else i call it a infrastructure service i provide you the machine along with a development and deployment environment i call it a platform as a service but you do not have to you do not require anything and then you still require some third party software to make use of you get a software as a service so these are the three things which we saw it where the cloud offerings were there then it came uh, something like a docker kind of environment in last 10 years they became prominent uh, and then people have started industry started using them because of the isolation and uh, because of the cost of running you actually uh, uh, containers were a smaller unit you do not have to 
uh, reserve the virtual machine for a longer period of time, so your cost is cut. Okay, and that's how you go here. One of the things which I like to tell you, probably in case if you have cameras with you, you can take a picture or this slide should be available to you also. You can actually work on to see that how, how well uh, you can uh, work on. You can go and this is a uh, free offering on the cloud, training.play-with-docker.com, where you can, you can see some examples where you can uh, work on creating your Docker images, uh, creating own Docker images, writing your own program and check it out. Or else, another thing you can do is that you have your own operating system on top of which you can have a Docker engine, and then you can create those images, put it into a secondary storage, and then allow the students to actually play with them. So you can you can see that how exactly that work also. Now the question that was there, which I was talking to you earlier, that there are quite few similarities which you saw here. We call is a, a container is a service. We call this CAAS and PAAS. That looks very similar. Uh, there are many uh, actually users who call them as a very similar, but there are certain differences here. The PAAS is basically an operational model. It is an application delivery model to be more precise. So it is basically a method for delivering the capabilities. Something if you have seen it in the service oriented architecture, you have a capabilities and there are uh, there are the actors which can consume those capabilities so it is a basically a model of delivery so platform as a service is a model of a delivery a mechanism for one party something like a service provider to deliver the application deployment hosting and execution capabilities to the another party so this is a model of delivery based upon the service oriented architecture Okay, one important thing is that if I talk about a platform as a service, everything is on the service provider's control. It's like since they are providing your deployment and uh, development capabilities. So though even if I trust it, but the things would be at service provider's mercy. It would be there. If I talk about the container, which is quite similar to what I see here in the form of a pass, which look like, but of course, there's a fundamental difference here because this is a service delivery model, pass. Containers are, if I talk about another aspect that we are going to talk about, are architectural primitives or more uh, specifically an application encapsulation primitives. Like you, it is architectural style. You have, uh, uh, you have the capability to package everything into one and then run it. So it is not, it's, it's, it's cannot be compared with a, uh, with a delivery model actually. Okay, so this is a fundamental difference I thought I will talk about. Now I'll, uh, uh, I would take you to another um, thing that is going on, it's an interesting topic to talk about. From uh, hypervisors, which actually divides the machine into a virtual machines, we discuss something about the container part. Here is an application with dependencies which are packaged into one. But nowadays people are talking more about the serverless. And one of the first such offerings was done by AWS Lambda. Here, what has been done that your application has been broken into the form of a functions. And these functions will execute in response to some triggers. People call them as Lambdas. And this is actually came from the functional programming paradigm. You would see in functional programming paradigm, you have lambdas there. Okay, I'll not go into the detail of that, but what I will see here is something like, first I have no sharing, then I have a virtual machine where I'm sharing the hardware. Then after that, I have a container kind of a thing where you have a hardware and operating systems are shared container will bring their own runtime application dependencies libraries and everything they bring it they run there so in the form of a container and the fourth one is a serverless offering we call it a lambdas now how they are different just like you have shared resources as hardware operating system and runtime everything would be shared but the application would execute 
as and when required on the runtime. We call it a lambda here, and it uses a functional programming paradigm. Or we uh, we we actually we write also an event driven programming. Uh, to be more specific, I do not say functional programming paradigm. It uses a event driven programming in order to execute those functions. So from the beginning, if I look into, we had a traditionally it was a, a monolithic approach of uh, development where the whole application was composed as a single piece. You can see here. And as the monolithic applications are not reusable being a single piece, therefore the microservices architecture uh, development was evolved. You can see in the middle one. So in case of a microservice architecture, we make the independent components and then we glue them together. Here the service is built, tested and deployed independently, making it more agile. But with microservices approaches also, we have an operational overhead because the managing those independent components are not easy. So we have a function as a service kind of a paradigm, which is what? So in case of a function as a service, we upload the piece of functionality to the cloud. I, I upload the piece of the functionality to the cloud and then it is executed independent to a particular trigger. So we don't need to bother rest of the anything of the, about the code. That is what is a kind of an thing architecture that has been involved in here. So let us talk something about a serverless kind of thing. So serverless is implemented as a function as a service because of FAAS, or sometimes people call it a backend, backend as a service also. Here the requests are built based upon the execution of a particular function. So in case of a AWS, it is presently it is a hundred microsecond. It is fixed here. For it, that means for every hundred microsecond execution, you have to pay for it. It is an event-driven programming model which provides a framework for the creation of that particular code. So we run the code without provisioning or managing the server. And that's why it is known as a serverless. So there is no operating system and other related worries. Now, one of the important thing is that they are short running and stateless in nature, but also can scale it automatically and instantly. So here is like you have some form of a functional handler with a in a service providers uh, zone where the application there are several serv serverless functions can execute here. Now, who provides you? So there are a couple of uh, actually players who actually provides you this facility, AWS Lambda. So Amazon provides you in the form of uh, one of the first to provide the serverless offering. So you pay for whatever function that you have executed. That is a kind of the model it has. Google also has its own version for serverless platform, which is called as a Google Cloud Functions. IBM also announced IBM Bluemix or Apache OpenWisk is an open source serverless platform. Other than that, you have um, something like a, a Microsoft Azure. You have a open source Open Lambda and uh, Open FAS. So these are the few things uh, which are there as a serverless offering here. Why it is so important? Look, suppose that if I if I see from that perspective, serverless offering, it's like you may have the collection of uh, different sensors or other devices. So Dr. Satish will talk about those other devices in the next class. It will be very interesting to actually listen to his talk. But in case if that some of the sensors would be would be actually uh, continuously sending the messages and something like a message is something the AC functioning is depleted to 20%. So message actually based upon the analytics that has been done on this device. Again, I will tell you, Dr. Satish will talk about that would be very interesting to know. And then you go to like, uh, like this message goes to uh, something like a, uh, uh, to a service center. And the service center message is something like identify the customer and uh, replace something. 
Now, this is called, called a, a true execution. So, so let's, the events are triggered and based upon that triggering of the event, some function executes here. So here event would be something like something happened, your AC function is not functioning or your tire is not having enough uh, air into it. That would trigger some another uh, functionality and the action corresponding to that. That is what is a beauty of serverless. So whatever you execute for that period of time, you have to pay for that. So AWS Lambda or Azure or anything, they will provide you this kind of functionality. Actually, they provide you the offering on into IoT devices as well for such event-driven programming. Now, there are several challenges uh, when we talk about a serverless or containers. There are many people who ask that whether how do I really realize this serverless? So presently, actually, it, containers are used in order to realize the serverless because inside the container also, I can think about the same uh, runtime available, but I can write it in the form of a function. And then as and when certain events actually occurs, those functions can execute. So with the use of container, it is possible for you to realize the serverlessness. But there are several uh, actually challenges here. I would like to uh, mention a couple of them, monitoring and debugging, execution time uh, limitations. Cold start is another interesting aspect, multi-tenancy concern, inadequate application testing, increasing security concerns, so on. And uh, with our students, we are actually presently in our group, we are working on a cold start. Uh, that how do I how do I actually reduce it cold start? multi tenancy is another um, like important problem because it is a architecture which is common into cloud computing, where the single instance of a software provides service to multiple customers or tenants. So multiple multi -ten tenancy is is about that here. So one of the classical example is Lambda uh, in serverless technology uh, provided by them, which actually allow uh, multiple such um, invocation of the same software here in the form of tenants. If I want to compare this, what I have. So I have the unit of scale. In case of a virtual machine, the granularity is a machine. In case of a container, it is an application. In case of a serverless, it is a function. What is hidden? So in case of a virtual machine, the hardware is hidden. In case of a container, the operating system is hidden. In case of a serverless, it's like a language a runtime is hidden. The user would be running directly on top of that. The packaging, granularity of packaging is, in case of a virtual machine, one of the classical example is Amazon uh, machine image. In case of a container, it would be a container file that I'm writing which would actually tell that what are the images I want to embed it into. In case of a serverless, it would be a code, the function that I'm writing. If I talk about a configuration, then you have, in case of a virtual machine, it is a machine, storage, networking, operating system, and so on. And then you can see here the execution pattern, which is very important to see here. In case of virtual machine, you can have a multi-threaded applications or multi-task application where the processes are there. In case of a multi-thread, it will be sharing the same resources. In case of a container, it would be multi-threaded or single task because one task can execute or multiple threads can execute. That is a container. But in case of a server level, because it is the smallest unit of execution that I'm talking about, a single task. So I, either it would be a single thread or a single task that would be executing here. How you are charged for it? So runtime, if I look into the hours of hours to months, in case of virtual machine, in case of a container, I, you would have a minutes of days, minutes to days. In case of a serverless, it would be a second to a microsecond because you would be running that function based upon the event that occurs and so on. So you can, Amazon has all the three offering virtual machine in terms of a EC2. In case of a container, you have elastic com container services. In case of a serverless, it has an offering of in the form of AWS lambdas and so on. I was talking about a cold start. Uh, like I would just see how much time it is remaining with me. I quickly would like to uh, like, uh, show you uh, what is the work that probably you can think about and work on. So something like when Amazon is offering you serverless thing, then you have to start the container and download the code. So we call it a cold, cold start. And then when the, the, the billing will start from here, when we initialize the package and dependencies, and then you have a, when you execute the task. And then uh, what Amazon does it, it actually 
uh, charge for everything here to here. The here from here billing actually begins, but uh, initializing the packages and dependencies will also be a part of that. And it will charge. So granularity is 100 millisecond and so on. So uh, actually in one of the works, we thought of like try to find it out whether it is, uh, we are working in our team that it is possible for us to know that uh, I can still uh, retain that container instead of again access, accessing the container from, and then uh, so I can reduce the charges required for cold start and so on. So that is one of the research work that our students are actually working on. I'll just skip those, these slides. Um, so, uh, well, I'll go to this one. So I look into those uh, evolution in web-based computing. You have a standalone to begin with, then you have a website based where you have application and data available on your machine. And then with the use of a browser, you are accessing the data with, uh, with a browser. Then you have a cloud offering where you have several such applications are running along with the data. You have several data points also. You, you can make use of those uh, offerings from a cloud. And then now what, uh, what has been done in recent times is that um, IoT along with the big data is becoming a big wave because uh, big data is about a volume, variety, velocity, uh, veracity, and there are, because nowadays even six Vs are available and so on, uh, which are collected from geographically distributed IoT devices. The amount of the data that has been captured here is a lot. The data is collected and stored continuously and grow exponentially. And it is certain times it is not even possible uh, for you to actually store it because of the uh, nature of the IoT device that you work on. The sensor data which is coming at every, every five seconds and so on, where do I store it? So I require to have a storage. I want to do some kind of analytics on top of that. I want to perform certain operation on that and so on, take certain decisions. So the data is very important. It is collected and stored continuously and grow exponentially. So the traditional solutions that we look into something like a server kind of environment where I can store it, or if I look into the earlier streaming uh, software systems where we can store the data here, that may not scale to. So the solution is aggregate and process the data from things in the cloud through something. So the, through something, you have to wait for certain time there. So the IoT applications with uh, uh, all the APIs and other interfaces that would be push and pull the data or command to and from the IoT sensors, node or devices and applications. So IoT actually uh, uses some kind of different kind of a uh, protocols which runs on top of TCP IP. One of the examples is something like MQTT, which you message queuing telemetry transport, which is a lightweight publish subscribe messaging protocol, specially designed for low bandwidth, high latency, unreliable networks that would be used in order to uh, end with the uh, publish subscribe messaging model, which would be uh, the devices would, would be continuously sending it. And then there would be some kind of a uh, in middle servers, which would be subscribed to the data that would be continuously getting it in the form of a messages. And then it would be transported to the cloud for a higher level analytics to be done here. Uh, well, uh, this is hot. You can MTQ if you, uh, is one of the good options for sending the high amount of data, but there are several other protocols are also available. Uh, and probably you would, you would have gone through in, in this FDP is where they can perform the analytics uh, once this data has been captured and, and available in cloud solutions. So uh, you can have the analytical engines on the cloud, something like radiation data, data, machine learning and AI based application, even it can come down slightly from the cloud and then uh, you can actually work on. So now this is where you have now we reach to uh, the place where uh, it is not only the cloud, but it is a IoT plus cloud. So the data would be coming uh, are stored from IoT devices. Those IoT devices may be offering several solutions, maybe a home automation, it may be offering, or it may be offering some other business automation, or there are several offerings which are available here, but that data need to be captured and then it need to be sent uh, through some intermediate things to the cloud. So that is where uh, you have a lot of things which are going here. In order to uh, have the uh, proper execution models, 
uh, the people in the area which are working in the area of cloud computing, they have several offerings. They started with a, a platform as a service and then they reached to the serverless kind of environments, which can uh, realize the uh, proper execution of certain queries which are coming from those uh, IoT devices here. So, well, there are several challenges where you can think about doing the research. There are several ways you can ask or engage the students also in your respective colleges to talk or work on some of these projects maybe in the form of a small project some of them can be taken as a phd problems and then can work on monitoring and debugging of those serverless things is one of the most important challenges because so many of them are there interoperability of uh, different offerings of those services load balancing is another interesting uh, topic where you can work on um, how do i really uh, do a execution uh, time limitation because uh, if do we do we have a dynamic uh, a timing execution timing uh, this thing can i how do i actually come up with those cold start which i spoke spoke to you earlier you have a multi tenancy concerns uh, like how many of them how how much i can scale it whether this software can uh, this engine can allow more than these many number of things mean these many number of containers to be executed or how do i scale them inadequate application testing uh, like this is another uh, common problem that people actually work on and then security concerns. So these are the important challenges. Uh, there are several researchers which are working on this. We can also think about and work on, on these areas. Uh, with that, I would uh, thank you all. I, I have taken you from, uh, from the virtual machine to the present offering that cloud offers, uh, something in the form of a serverless. And uh, those offerings can be uh, used in uh, in some of the applications which are appearing from from uh, iod so this is what i thought i would actually uh, talk to you i would uh, and then i would uh, now uh, open uh, this uh, session for your comments or discussions or questions thank you very much sir uh, really it is an interesting session and we are just enlightened with the uh, knowledge that you have shared with us. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that uh, the participants, at least they have now uh, uh, able to understand how we have connected our Raspberry Pi and they were able to access it. Yesterday, people are asking, so we are connected to Raspberry Pis. In fact, uh, if uh, participants have understood very clearly the session, the answer, they might have got it now. So for this participants, I would like to just share that the Raspberry Pis which were connected is based on the Docker's. So the Docker's, based on the Docker concept only, you are able to remotely log in to those Raspberry Pis. And for today's practice session also, you'll be connecting to other set of Raspberry Pis for computer vision processing and other things. So the concepts and the knowledge the sir has shared with you all definitely will help you to set up your own cloud platforms as well as the containers and the dockers will nowadays are very much widely used. And of course, the serverless computing is what the data analysis is very much required for IoT data to be performed using the Lambda functions. So definitely those uh, uh, knowledge will definitely, I'm sure that uh, uh, all of you will definitely be get benefit from those things. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Sir, there are two questions. I'll just quickly will answer to them. Uh, like uh, one of the questions which was coming was that how the security would be provided in the cloud computing. So yes, the security is definitely has been a, always been an issue whether I talk about a normal machine or something and there is no measure of security that how secure you are is certain things that uh, that is always been, uh, been a question because it is a confidence that you have. It's like I feel that I am secure. So how secure is, is something that has always been uh, a question. The security in cloud computing uh, works at a several level. It's starting from the hardware level uh, to a highest level. Uh, the concerns are there. So whether I, my hardware is secure or not, or where when I'm working on a data center, so how my applications uh, which are running parallelly, uh, they were be secure. So the security is a big umbrella if I talk from the cloud perspective because it has a level. It has a several layers actually. So at every layer, there is a security. And there is no single solution available. Something like a grid security infrastructure that work with um, uh, Globus. Uh, it is not possible for, for you to actually uh, scale it to the cloud. 
So cloud has a different kind of requirement, whether it is infrastructure, if I talk about, so probably anything which we do it in a normal infrastructure would be a security solution. If I talk about platform is required different kind of thing. So security as such, there's no single solution available. People have to think about that for which offering I'm talking about a security. This was the first answer. The another answer, another question that came is about a load balancing for a serverless uh, kind of environment. Somebody was asking it. So, uh, well, um, since the granularity of execution time is very small, it's only 100 milliseconds. So how do I really do a load balancing when, uh, when the things are running? So during the running, load balancing is not a really a clever idea. We always uh, actually discuss about that thing because uh, if I know that, okay, there is, there is a, um, some presently it is a container which is used for uh, providing the uh, serverless offering. So one of the things that we can do is to find it out the physical limitation of that particular uh, virtual machine on which we are creating those containers. So something like if I'm going for more number of containers, I should be able to create another virtual machine on another, another uh, uh, server where I can actually uh, put another set of containers and so on. So there are several uh, load balancing techniques that are available. People are really working on that. Again, this is, uh, this is one of the solutions probably you can look into. Uh, some of them uh, asked me that whether the slides should be available. So yes, these are the open slides uh, that I have. I have actually also collected from many of my uh, peers, many of my colleagues. So all those slides are in open uh, this thing. They would be available to you also for uh, any any further this thing. I would be sharing those things. Probably Dr. Naginder has uh, like he has must have scheduled something for that. So I would discuss with him and, uh, and give it to him so that he can schedule it to all of you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll collect it from you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, Srinivas, sir, can you please send the polling, please? Yes, sir. I will start. Sir. What so is this, sir, um, polling? Uh, this basically a session feedback, sir, uh, on uh, basically a formality to be completed for this uh, programs. Oh, okay. okay. Just a small uh, exercise, sir. That is only thing. So uh, as of now, today we have uh, in this session 137 participants, sir. Uh -huh. So yeah, more or less the, similarly to the last sessions. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you once again, sir. So we'll wind up the session now. So thank you so much, actually. Yeah. It's so, so nice the, of you that uh, uh, you have actually. Uh, spent your time and then uh, you listen to it. Many of you may be working in your own area. But I thought that uh, if I want to speak uh, about cloud computing in FDP in IoT, I should be talking something from uh, uh, where exactly no. it starts and uh, uh, what no. IoT no. has to offer. To. No, no, sir. It's basically you have given the complete details. In fact, uh, maybe uh, maybe some kind of uh, idea may not come to that. What is related to the IoT? But no, no, no. I think it is completely relevant. And uh, it's uh, absolutely wonderful, and uh, definitely they might have gained some knowledge, because nowadays uh, Docker's in the containers this is what IoT devices uh, very much require: yes. uh, the lightweight uh, containers and the Docker's. So they don't want to run uh, uh, heavyweight processes and heavyweight operating systems. Right. right. So to run your uh, run the AI methods and all, uh, they can directly use the Docker instead of uh, installing the operating system, the dependency files, and so on and so forth. Instead of that, they can directly uh, pull the Docker and uh, make use of that in their uh, uh, resource constraint computing devices. Yeah, right. So for that, the basic complete knowledge you have given it, sir, actually. It's thank absolutely, you, sir. absolutely so nice. wonderful. Thank you very much, sir. So nice, sir. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for all the participants for listening. It. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So uh, just a small announcement for the participants. Uh, actually, some of them are asking for the... Uh, uh, recordings and as well as the slides. So uh, anyway, I'm following it up with uh, uh, other search also to give the size. So yesterday session three slides already I have requested uh, Professor Atul Nehi, sir. So sir is uh, collecting the uh, papers which have been discussed in the presentation. So he will put all the papers in, a, in along with the slides and he will give us the zip file. So kindly hold on. So once I receive it from the sir, I will share it to you. So similarly, I'll collect the slides from others uh, because anyway, it is a requirement for the program to be submitted as a report. So I will definitely share to you all. So we will meet at exactly 
12 noon. So we have another wonderful session from uh, Dr. Satish Sri Rama. So who is working on edge computing. So it is mostly uh, related to our IoT stuffs and other things. So uh, thank you uh, one and all. So we'll meet at uh, 12 noon, please. Thank you. ఛాన్ <laughs> తర్వాత ఏమైందంటే మీకు ఫస్ట్ లో టూ ఫస్ట్ లో ఫస్ట్ లో ఆర్డర్ ప్రకారం టూ హండ్రెడ్ మెంబర్స్ షార్ట్ లిస్ట్ చేశారు అందులో మీరు లేరు నేను ఏమైందంటే కొంతమంది పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ ఒక కొప్పుల ఆఫ్ పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ రిక్వెస్ట్ పెట్టారు వాళ్ళ పర్సనల్ రీజన్స్ కాలేజ్ లో వర్క్స్ గురించి అటెండ్ కాలేకపోతున్నామని చెప్పారు డ్రాప్ అయ్యా డ్రాప్ అవుతామని చెప్పారు 
సో అందుకు నీ అంటే మీరు అఫ్ కోర్స్ మీరు అప్లై చేస్తారు కానీ మీరు షార్ట్ లిస్ట్ అవ్వలేదు కదండి టాప్ అవి టూ హండ్రెడ్ లో లేరు యాక్చువల్ లో ఓన్లీ టూ హండ్రెడ్ లో ఉన్న వాళ్ళకి మేము లింక్స్ అవన్నీ మెయిల్ మెయిల్ పెట్టడము లింక్స్ అవి షేర్ చేస్తాము నిన్నయం ఒక నలుగురు ఐదు అటెండ్ కా లేకపోతే జస్ట్ వెయిట్ నిన్న ఈవినింగ్ మాకు మెసేజ్ పెట్టారు మేము డ్రాప్ అవుదాం అనుకుంటున్నాము అని చెప్పేసి సరే చాలా వెయిటింగ్ లిస్ట్ లో చాలా రిక్వెస్ట్ వస్తున్నాయి పర్సనల్ గా కూడా మమ్మల్ని కన్సిడర్ చేయండి అని సో ఆ వెయిటింగ్ లిస్ట్ లో ఉన్న వాళ్ళని ఆర్డర్ ప్రకారం జస్ట్ కాల్ చేసాం అండి సో ఎవరన్నా ఉంటే కానీ నిన్నట్లో క్లోజ్ అయిపోతుంది కదా అందుకని వెయిటింగ్ లిస్ట్ లో ఉన్న వాళ్ళని ఏమైనా ఇంట్రెస్ట్ ఉంటుందేమో అని చేసాము బట్ మీరు తర్వాత కొద్దిగా అదే ఆల్ టైమింగ్ కదా నేను యాక్చువల్ గా అప్పటికే టెన్ అయిపోయింది రెడీ అయిపోయింది మీరు చేసిన అంటే పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ రెస్పాన్స్ ఇచ్చింది మాకు చెప్పిన తర్వాత సరే ఎందుకు ఎవరన్నా వెయిటింగ్ లిస్ట్ లో చాలా మంది అడుగుతున్నారు కదా రిక్వెస్ట్ పెడుతున్నారు కదా అని చేసామండి మేము నెక్స్ట్ ఇంకొక మీట్ చేసిన తర్వాత మీరు కొద్దిగా బిజీగా ఉన్నారు కదా లైక్ తర్వాత నెక్స్ట్ పార్టిసిపేట్ కి అలౌ చేసామండి యాక్సెప్ట్ చేసేసాం ప్రాబ్లం లేదు సార్ దాని గురించి మనం మర్చిపోవచ్చు ఇంకా ఓకే సర్టిఫికేట్ ఏమి ఉండదు సార్ ఇంకా మీరు అసలు షార్ట్ లిస్ట్ అదే మీరు జాయిన్ అవ్వలేదు కదా ఇంకా ప్రోగ్రామ్ లో మీరు యాక్చువల్ గా ఫస్ట్ టూ హండ్రెడ్ లేదు సార్ షార్ట్ లిస్ట్ మనకి లిమిట్ ఉంటుంది టూ హండ్రెడ్ మెంబర్స్ కి పెట్టగలుగుతాం అనమాట ప్రోగ్రామ్ మీరు అప్లికేట్ సార్ మీరు యాక్చువల్ గా ఫస్ట్ 